Set course for Epsilon and engage quantum drive. Course set, drive engaged. Egotastic fun time. Hey gang, I'm JP and welcome back to Talking the Orville on Egotastic Fun Time. Today we're going to have a great time diving deeper into the world of the Orville and take a look back at some of the locations and characters we were introduced to in the pilot episode, Old Wounds. In the series premiere, written by Seth MacFarlane and directed by John Favreau, we're introduced to newly promoted Planetary Union Captain Ed Mercer and the rest of the Orville crew, Bordis, Alara, Gordon, John, Claire, and Isaac. And my ex-wife, Kelly Grayson. As they set out on a maiden space voyage to deliver supplies to Epsilon 2, where they quickly learned that delivering scientist bottles and microscopes or whatever is just a ruse to get the Union there to help protect a technological breakthrough from getting into the wrong hands. In this episode, we're briefly introduced to Planetary Union Central, located in 25th century New York City. It's nice to see a completely green, clean Manhattan that seamlessly incorporates futuristic skyscrapers blending in with the more iconic New York imagery that we're all used to seeing. This opening sequence lets us know that 400 years in the future, Earth has finally gotten its act together. We've solved poverty and hunger as well as the class system. A crazy person pooping into a trash can down in the subway hardly ever happens anymore. It's truly a utopian future. It's also nice to know that Lady Liberty still stands ready to welcome all who come, a beacon of hope, not only for characters existing in the Orville universe, but also for us, the viewer. Welcome to our utopian vision of humanity on your television, friend. It sure beats all the other versions of the Statue of Liberty we usually see in movies and TV shows that take place in the future. Damn you all to hell! When we're first introduced to Admiral Halsey, played by Victor Garber in his office at Union Headquarters, we can clearly see that the building is located adjacent to Central Park, and you can actually see the Empire State Building in the background. Here's an exterior shot of the building as well. Captain Mercer is a New Yorker, you guys. I got a gun. Let's get to a Broadway show. After Ed grabs Gordon and they head to the Orville for the first time, we get our only look so far at the massive Union dockyard in orbit around Earth. This thing is huge! Sure, the Orville's only a mid-sized exploratory vessel, but it's pretty big by our standards, yet it's completely dwarfed by Earth's dockyard. Now, I'm not going to be getting into the main cast of the show in this episode, you guys. I'm saving that for character spotlights I'll be releasing soon. In fact, go ahead and tell me in the comments below which member of the Orville cast you'd like me to start with. I'm kind of thinking of beginning with Gordon Malloy. He's kind of my spirit animal on this show, but let me know what you guys think. When Ed first goes to tell Gordon that he's got his own ship and he wants him to be the helmsman, we learned that environmental simulators, aka holodecks, exist in the Orville universe. It's also the only time we get to meet Justin the Ogre, played by Patrick Cox. I also like that you're able to give simulated characters standby personalities reflective of the player, so both can interact naturally after breaking character within a simulation. Hey dude, this is my buddy Ed. Hey Ed, nice to meet you, I'm Justin. How are you? Oh great, super, always, always such a treat to meet one of Gordon's friends. When the crew makes their way to the research facility, they're introduced to Dr. Aronoff, played by Brian George. He's the director of Epsilon 2, who's hoping the captain can provide protection against the Krill, who want to steal and weaponize the temporal acceleration device they've invented. He's also a dog lover. See that dog in the background licking his balls? First thing I saw. Nicknamed the Scientist Playground, Epsilon 2 is a pure research facility located on an Earth-like planet. A hub that smart brain people petition for the opportunity to work there because its laboratories are all flush with science. Besides having everything a person could want, even for this guy who comes from the same species as Lieutenant Dan apparently, there are no bars on Epsilon 2. How about strip clubs? Gordon. Sorry. There are no strip clubs. The building used for this location was shot at one Baxter Way in Westlake, California, but some of you might recognize it as the headquarters for the San Angeles Police Department in Demolition Man. Earlier in the episode, we get a quick glimpse of our first non-humanoid life form in the Orville universe, Yoffit, voiced by Norm MacDonald. But we're also introduced to another non-humanoid alien at Epsilon 2, Dr. Jorvik. <laughs> 
Here's the original sketch that Seth MacFarlane gave to the special effects team to create this character next to the fully realized Dr. Jorvik from the episode. The main Epsilon 2 laboratory where we're introduced to the anti-banana ray and that dick Derek was actually just a redress of the Orville's standing cafeteria set. Now I wanted to bring up the temporal acceleration device because of what Alara says to Dr. Aronov. Or entire armies reduced to frail elders instantly. You do realize this could also be used as a weapon. Luckily, Ed and Kelly were able to use the device against the Krill by sabotaging it. Happy Arbor Day, boys. You got wood. But Aronov and his team still have the necessary knowledge to create another temporal device, don't they? I mean, I really don't see how Dr. Aronov and the potential of this technology won't be coming up again in season two. I mean, imagine all the uses for this breakthrough. It would have to be the most sought after discovery in the universe. So I would definitely expect to see more of the doctor, the device, and the krill in season two. In Old Wounds, the show keeps our understanding of the krill limited. I'll be doing a special episode on the krill later on, but right now let's get into the krill gear that we were introduced to in this episode. Our first look at the Krill shows them wearing fully armored uniforms and helmets that open and retract automatically to expose their gross albino alligator faces. In full regalia, they kind of look like insects. Now with all this gear on, not to mention the prosthetics to make a person look like a Krill soldier, it's almost impossible for an actor to feel anything going on around them during the action. So the prop designer built tappers into the Krill assault weapons, which makes it so the actors can actually feel a reaction when they fire the weapon. The Krill are obviously the big bad guys in the Orville universe. They're a danger to the Union and anyone that gets in their way. They don't seem to care about diplomacy and they especially don't care about how to frame a shot properly. Sorry, can you can you move like two steps to your right? It's just a lot of dead space there. Just, yeah, just right there. Perfect. Yeah, sorry, you were just very weirdly framed. It was all I could focus on. The last thing I'm going to talk about today is the star of the Oroville, the ship itself. No, JP, we call ships her, not it. Ships are girls. No, they're not. Ships don't have vaginas. Well, I guess the docking bay could be considered a vagina, but that's... No, shut up. Designed to be a medium-sized exploratory vessel, the Orville's look evolved around the concept of rings of exotic material, spatial tensor coils, that would process dark energy into a quantum drive that folds space to allow the ship to travel faster than light. The ship has upper, middle, and lower quantum engines, and a fluid, elegant design overall. Now one thing I really like about Union ships is that they all have a uniformed look. Realistically, this is how a unified organization like the Planetary Union would work. When you watch a military movie or documentary, every tank and vehicle looks the same because that's how the world works. Somebody designs something and if that something is good, they make copies of that something. They have 3,000 ships in the Union fleet. They're not going to have 3,000 different designs. They're not Funko Pops. Throughout the season, we're introduced to more areas of the ship, but in this episode, we're given access to the shuttle bay, Ed's office, complete with a more subtle version of Kermit the Frog, Gordon's quarters, some corridors, a staircase that was actually salvaged by Fox from American Horror Story and reused for the Orville, and most importantly, the bridge, which is located right on top of the ship with an open, clear bubble ceiling that reminds me of one of my other favorite starships. <laughs> Old Wounds is a great start for the Orville as a new sci-fi series picking up the torch abandoned long ago by Star Trek that it's now using to forge its own path to a franchise legacy free of canon and all the other trappings of a fandom that's been evolving for over 50 years. Now one thing that the Orville does differently and in my opinion better than Star Trek ever did is they make you feel like this utopian vision of our future was actually created by and is lived in by a more truthful and realistic version of humanity. In 400 years, people are still people, even though they're living in a technological wonderland. They still have relationship problems, insecurity issues. They can't wait to get off work. It's a future I'd feel right at home in, and I think you probably would too. Especially if the Krill are having a pizza party and everyone's invited. Oh, oh man, can, Morgan, we go? can we please go down there? A pizza party? It's for office birthdays. 
Okay, that's it. That's all I wanted to talk about today, and I talked about it. How about you? Do you think we'll be seeing Dr. Aronov and the Anti-Banana Ray again in Season 2 of The Orville? What do you love most about Old Wounds? Do you think we'll ever see Justin the Ogre again? You can let me know what you think by joining the conversation below. Thank you so much for liking, sharing, and subscribing to my stupid show. It really does mean the world to me. I'll see you very soon, and as always, I hope all your times are egotastic fun times. Love you, bye-bye! Egotastic fun time, we're gonna have a great time. Egotastic fun time, give me all your money. Give him all your money. You will find it funny. Just give me money. I love money. Give me all your money! Give me all your money! Give me all your money! Give me all your money!